So, uh, so you heard about our distinguished student lectures. Uh, this year we have three fantastic people. Um, the first person is going to be uh, Kendra Kuhl, who's a senior PhD candidate working in the laboratory of Thomas Jaramillo in the Stanford's Department of Chemical Engineering. Uh, she's studying the electrochemical conversion of CO2 into fuels and chemicals as a way of reducing CO2 emissions. Uh, she's also been recognized with an NSF Graduate Student Research Fellowship. Uh, with that, uh, Kendra, welcome. Thank you for the introduction, Sally, and thank you for the opportunity to talk today about our research on electrochemical reduction of carbon dioxide on transition, transition metal surfaces. So the overall goal of our research is to be able to create an, an artificial carbon cycle. We're all familiar with this part of the cycle, where we can combine hydrocarbons with oxygen and via combustion make carbon dioxide water and release energy. We use this energy for things like driving our cars and producing electricity. What we're trying to do is the other side of the cycle taking carbon dioxide plus water, adding in energy, and getting out hydrocarbons that we can use as fuels and chemicals that currently come from petroleum. We'd like to be able to do this electrochemically because that allows the energy source that we use to be a CO2-free renewable source, such as wind or solar. But in order to do it electrochemically, we need to split the reaction into two half reactions, water oxidation, which occurs at the anode, and carbon dioxide reduction, which occurs at the cathode. Thermodynamically, water, ox water oxidation takes place at 1.23 volts, and carbon dioxide reduction takes place at zero volts. Unfortunately, carbon dioxide reduction is a very difficult reaction, and so we need to apply an excess voltage in order to make the reaction go forward, which we refer to as an overpotential. The fact that we have to add this extra energy in makes it less efficient, and so one role of catalysts is to decrease the extra voltage that we have to put in in order to make things more efficient. The other role is selectivity. There are a number of different products we can make from carbon dioxide. And so we need a catalyst that just makes the single product that we're interested in for our desired application. The other reason is that unfortunately, hydrogen evolution also takes place at zero volts and is a kinetically easy reaction. And so it's difficult to find a catalyst that will favor carbon dioxide reduction over hydrogen evolution, but that's what we need to do. Uh, we decided to look first at transition metals as catalysts for this reaction, partially because there was already some literature and some understanding of this reaction on transition metals. And the first step was believed to be that carbon dioxide is reduced to carbon monoxide via two electron, two proton reduction. And once you form carbon monoxide, a number of different outcomes are possible depending upon the binding energy of the carbon monoxide to the, ener to the metal surface used. So for metals that bind carbon monoxide very, very strongly, such as platinum, nickel, and iron, you actually end up producing mostly hydrogen gas from carbon dioxide reduction. Because once you form the CO, it stays on the metal as a poison and isn't released and is bound so tightly that it can't go on to react further. And so you get hydrogen evolved in breaks in this monolayer of CO on the metal surface. On the other hand, metals that bind carbon monoxide very weakly, such as gold, silver, and zinc, tend to produce mostly carbon monoxide because as soon as it's produced, it's released from the metal surface, and again, can't go on to react to make hydrocarbons and alcohols. The exception to this amongst the transition metals is copper, because it has an intermediate carbon monoxide binding energy. So the carbon monoxide isn't released, but it isn't bound so tightly that it can't go on to react further and be reduced to hydrocarbons and alcohols. Um, again, looking at the literature, we saw that this first step had, was pretty well understood. Carbon dioxide goes to carbon monoxide. But then after that, reducing carbon monoxide further to make these more complicated products was really something that people didn't understand very well. And so we realized there's a real need to understand more about the mechanism of making these more reduced products. So of course, when we started our project, we had to first design a system in order to reduce carbon dioxide and measure the products. And this is just a schematic of the electrolysis cell that we ended up using to do that. So for the anode, we used a platinum counter electrode where the water is oxidized, and our cathode where carbon dioxide reduction occurs is shown here as a copper electrode, but could be any metal that we're interested in testing. Uh, we filled each side, the anode and the cathode, with electrolyte and separated the two with a membrane so the products made at the cathode side don't float over to the anode side and become reoxidized. We pr constantly purge the cell with carbon dioxide and then the, during the reduction reaction, and then the products in the gas phase can go to a gas chromatograph to be quantified. 
products in the liquid phase we measure with NMR by collecting the electrolyte at the end of each electrolysis experiment and quantifying it that way. The main advantage of this cell over something that we could just commercially buy is that we have a relatively large electrode surface area, 4.5 centimeters squared, and a small electrolyte volume, 8 milliliters. And that allows us to get a very high concentration of these carbon dioxide reduction products in the electrolyte so that we have a high sensitivity for them. So we started by applying our methods to a variety of different transition metals, selecting some from each group, those that bind carbon monoxide weakly, those that bind it strongly, and those that bind it with an intermediate binding energy, with copper. Um, and here you can just see those all compared together in a plot where the x-axis is the different potentials that we apply. Um, and then on the y-axis, you have the percent of the current at each of those different potentials going to reduce carbon dioxide. So you can see that some metals on this chart have very low percentages of their total current going to reduce carbon dioxide, namely platinum, nickel, and iron, those that bind CO strongly, just as we expected. However, copper, silver, gold, and zinc all show good current efficiency for carbon dioxide reduction. For example, that means that a high percentage of their current is going to reduce carbon dioxide instead of making hydrogen. If we look more specifically at exactly what products were seen, we see that it actually matches what we expected from literature exactly. However, in addition to what had already been reported in literature, we were able to see a number of new products that had not been previously seen due to the sensitivity of our setup. Namely, we saw that methane and methanol were actually produced on all the metals that we tested, not just on copper, so that all of the metals seem to be able to produce at least small amounts of hydrocarbons and alcohols. However, copper, of course, produces these things as a major product. And so for the rest of the presentation, I'm just going to focus on copper metal and specifically on our findings there. So this is just a table showing all the products that we saw um, from carbon dioxide reduction on a copper metal electrode, organized by number of carbons across the top and number of electrons needed to make each product across or down going down. Products shown in black are those that have been previously reported in the literature, while those shown in green are those that have appeared in only a few reports, and those shown in blue are those that we were able to see for the first time due to the sensitivity of our setup. And I don't think it's hard to see that a number of these products are already useful. Methane is the main component of natural gas, and ethylene is used to produce a variety of plastics. A number of the minor products as well are things that represent billion dollar industries. So just looking at this list, we can see that it's already possible to make fuels and chemicals via carbon dioxide reduction on transition metals. The real challenge then is to try to make it more efficient by reducing the overpotential and more selective. We don't want to make this whole mixture. We want to make just the product that we're interested in. In order to design catalysts to do that, we really need to understand something about the mechanism. And so we tried to look at our data and figure out as much as we could. And we started by looking at what's called a TOEFL plot, like this, where on the x-axis we have the applied potential, and on the y-axis we have the log of the current, partial current density going to each of our different products. Here we're just comparing methane and ethylene, and you can see that they behave fairly differently on this plot. Although they both begin around the same potential, as you go to higher and higher overpotential or more negative voltages, the ethylene actually tends to level off and even decrease a little bit at the highest overpotentials we tested. However, methane continues to increase across this potential range. This indicates that they're produced via different mechanistic pathways, which is probably what we would expect since one has one carbon and the other has two carbons. On the other hand, if we plot all of our products that have two or three carbons, or more than one carbon, together, we see that they all look pretty similar on this plot. They all begin low, increase into a peak potential um, around negative 1.1 volts, and then decrease again in partial current density at, their high, at the highest potentials that we measured. This indicates that they are produced via a similar mechanistic pathway. However, this is a little bit difficult to understand because when we look at the list of all these products, we see that they all have a wide variety of functional groups. We have alcohols, carbonyls, double bonds, and carboxylates all present. So how can we think of a single mechanism that can explain the presence of all of these different products? Another insight that we had is that a number of these products contain carbonyl groups that can be involved in a number of different equilibria reactions. Uh, aldehydes react with water to make diols, and all um, carbonyl groups can undergo tautomerism to an enol form. Here's a table of all the products we see that have a carbonyl group, 
And in the center column, are those are they're shown in their more traditional form, um, with the keto form, which you're probably more familiar with. And then the diol and enol form are shown on either side. And it's actually this, these diol and enol forms, which we've hypothesized are responsible for the multi-carbon product chemistry that we've observed. If we walk through the mechanism that we'd like to propose step by step, we'll start with glyoxyl, the first two carbon intermediate that we see, shown here in its enol form. This can undergo two proton, two electron reduction via dehydroxylation and remove this hydroxyl group to make acetate, also shown in its enol form. On the other hand, we could also remove this hydroxyl group, and that would leave us with glycol aldehyde, also in its enol form. If we remove a hydroxyl group from either acetate or glycol aldehyde, then we arrive at acid aldehyde, and removal of this final hydroxyl group leads to ethylene, our major product. However, all of these products are ones that we see being produced during the reaction. Um, and then looking at these enol forms and dehydroxylation, we can explain the majority of our two carbon products. However, to explain the presence of ethylene glycol and ethanol, we need to look at our, the diol forms as well. So glycol aldehyde is an aldehyde. It can react with water to make a diol, shown here. And we can dehydroxylate that also to make ethylene glycol and dehydroxylate that again to make ethanol. And so through this very simple mechanism involving these enol and diol forms and the simple dehydroxylative step applied over and over again, we think we can explain the presence of all of the different products we see, despite the fact that they are very diverse and have this different functionality. And if we apply the same sort of analysis to our three carbon products, it, it works just as well. So while we have not but actually directly probed what's happening on the electrode surface with our research to this point, it has allowed us to make a hypothesis. And so in the future, we'd like to go and look um, more directly with spectros spectros yeah, spectroscopic means at what's going on. And we can use this as, to guide us in that endeavor. So just to summarize, um, we started by making an experimental setup to be able to measure the products of carbon dioxide reduction very sensitively. Um, because of that, we were able to see hydrocarbon and, al and or alcohol production on all the metals that we tested. And again, because we were able to see these very, very minor products, we were able to come up with a possible pathway for their formation, um, for the minor product formation of the two and three carbon products on copper metal. And so just to conclude, uh, I think that it's basic understanding like this that we need to, of carbon dioxide reduction chemistry in order to eventually design catalysts to overcome our major challenges of efficiency and selectivity. I'd like to thank DCEF, of course, for funding and for the opportunity to talk today. Um, my three lab mates that also work on carbon dioxide reduction, and we all have posters out there later if you're interested. Um, the rest of the Jaramillo lab, and of course, our advisor, Professor Thomas Jaramillo, for all his support. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. So you postulate the diversity of products doing because of secondary reactions from a common primary product, if I got that right? Um, I think our hypothesis is that all of them are, all the products we see are intermediates that are formed on the way to the major product, but sometimes instead of being reduced further, that intermediate desorbs from the electrode and then doesn't go on to react further. And so we're measuring these products once they've desorbed, but they're all mostly intermediates. Well, I guess, could you feed that uh, like oxalate in it instead of CO2 and see if you evolve the same product stream, maybe not in this exact same ratios, but. So that's been done to some extent. So with, unfortunately, the enol form of these different products is very high energy. And so thermodynamically, these products don't form um, the enols if you put them in solution and try to react them further. And so that's something we've tried to think about is how can we make an enol-like intermediate on the electrode surface. Um, we've tried a few things, but it hasn't really worked because of their thermodynamic instability. But people have looked at the alcohol, like the diol forms, and those do follow this pathway if you reduce those.